Okay. Let me turn this off. So today, this lecture is on leptin, hunger, metabolism, and why it's important. Let me make sure you guys can see this. Okay. So leptin was discovered in 1994. They didn't really have a name for it. It's, uh, they knew it was a peptide hormone that they was coming from fat. They didn't understand what it did, but the fact that your fat is producing this hormone changes the way that we see it. Prior to this, fat was seen as just a fuel source. It didn't really have any messaging systems. They just knew that it was used for fuel. Yay, right? That it was used for cushioning, insulation, um, but they didn't really understand until around 1994 that this is bigger than that. Since then, they've discovered well over seven hormones that your fat cells produce. And when we look at it as an organ, that means that it is talking and cross-talking to other organs and that there is a messaging system, that there might be regulation within it and outside of it. And today it is now known as the king of the endocrine system. It essentially tells the brain that you're safe or not. It, it, it's basically a message. Your fat sends messages around your fuel availability. Um, it, it signals to the thyroid if you have the energy to burn the fuel to provide the, the um, resources to the energy your body needs, right? So it's kind of a big deal. The first thing they discovered about leptin, and it wasn't really given a name until later, like 1997, I graduated from college in 2000, okay? They had not talked about this. My degrees in exercise physiology, exercise science, this wasn't discussed until my senior year. And the professor who is a professor of physiology was like, oh my gosh, the discovery, it's called leptin. We're learning about it. It's amazing. It's just game changer, right? So any physician, doctor, anybody who has studied this, who graduated and hasn't gone back, doesn't really understand this. I had to go back because I was working in the uh, medical clinic and I was working with this process that wasn't approved. It was just uh, experimental and no one understood how it worked. And I had to go teach it to myself, this new science. And so again, and it's still evolving, but we do know today by around 2010, we knew science had kind of um, reconciled the reality that leptin regulates hunger, leptin regulates fat metabolism, and it regulates your thyroid, and it regulates, uh, it, helps, it helps with sleep, insulin, and a lot of different things. So um, it's kind of a big deal. And the way that I teach it simplifies it. So let's start with this. So when you look at energy fueling mechanisms, I'm going to keep it very simple. Think of it in terms of four things, right? So our body gets fuel. The primary source, does anybody know? What's the primary source of fuel that we have throughout the day? Anybody have an idea where our body gets its fuel primarily? Carbs? Nope. Nope. Fat. Fat metabolism. It supplies over 90% of the fuel that you all during your sleep, during your day. Um, so fat is the primary source of where our body accesses fuel. It's easy access to, and it's very resourceful, right? There's a ton of potential fuel in one lipid strand. Now, which one is number two? So if I were to name four, what is the second source of fuel? Nope. Glucose. Glucose. So those of you who said glucose first, you were pretty close, but it's actually fats, then glucose. But the body doesn't necessarily want to use glucose or blood sugar, but it's easy to. It's more available when you need it very fast. So think of this as when your body is not in exercise, you're like sitting here, you're using fat. 
generally. I mean, you're never uh, you're never a hundred percent just using one source. You get pretty close when you're sleeping at night, but you're kind of using a lot of these at different times. Like as soon as I stand up right now, like any fast movement, I'm probably using glucose. But as soon as I stand here, it's less and it's more fat. So glucose is a very it's it's fast glycolysis, right? That's what the splitting of glucose for fuel is called glycolysis. I, you're, so it's primarily fat. As soon as you stand up quickly, you're using a readily available ATP and glucose. What is the third fuel source? Make a guess. Yes, glycogen. So glycogen is a stored, oh, glycogen. I'm a terrible speller, but glycogen. Glycogen is fuel that's basically glucose changed a little bit, and it's easy to store in muscles in your liver. Glycogen is the best fuel source for sprinting. Two minutes, man. You have these reserves. It can be available. It can break down super fast. So glycogen. Again, so when you think of this, think it, think my body is likes to use this. This is its ideal fuel source. This is in quick movements, but it's not ideal. It really isn't in terms of, because it's regulated, blood is regulated for the brain. And I'll go into that in a second. Glycogen is in your muscles. It is ready right here, right now. So think of this as um, fight flight. These two here are primarily used to fight and flight. Right? And fat is like, we're cool, we're jamming, we're hanging out. We're doing great. The fourth fuel source, anybody have a guess? You got it. Protein, muscle, body, tissue, protein. Your body can use it, but it doesn't like to. And when your body uses protein for fuel, it doesn't discriminate where it takes it. It'll take it from your heart. It'll take it from anything and everything. So this is not ideal unless you're dying. Then you do want this. It, your body can live off of your own body parts for quite some time. Your organs get weaker, heart gets weaker, limbs get weaker, you get emaciated, right? So you can use your body protein for like a month, right? For quite some time. So of course we can use this, but it's not a really great situation. But the fact that our body can use protein is survival, right? This is kind of worst case scenario, survival. right so how this works is and one way for you to think about it and i need you to pay attention because there is going to be a quiz which one goes where your fat is um ideal use in terms of rest rest relax this means you're doing great everything is good everything is great okay Glucose is your brain's fuel. It's ideal for the brain, just so you know. So your, your blood glucose levels um, are within a very specific range. And I don't know if you guys have really thought this through, but have you guys been tested on what's the ideal blood glucose range? Anybody? Well, it's the same for everybody. Why do you think? Why is that? Even though our body sizes are different. Just think about that for a second. Why is it that my blood glucose ideal zone is the same exact ideal blood glucose as someone who's five foot or seven foot? The brain, our brains are the same. What's toxic for my brain is the same as what's toxic for your brain. So you need to, our blood sugar is regulated for the brain's needs. Right. And so if you were to go out and sprint and your blood glucose starts to be used because it's super fast and then gl glycogen is next, glycogen can break down into glucose. But the goal is to maintain blood sugar at the at a level your brain can stay conscious with. So when you're remembering this for a quiz, fat is the body's primary use. Glucose is for the brain right? And quick, fast bouts of exercise. Glycogen is for up to two, maybe three minutes of sprinting. This is getting away from the bear, right? 
And protein is when you're dining, when food is not available, when you do not have any resources. So death dying, sprinting from the bear, climbing up the tree as quickly as possible. So it's like 10 seconds, right? And this is, we're doing great. Fan freaking tastic. Does that make sense? So remember, blood glucose is regulated for your brain. Okay. So here is what they learned. Where does leptin come into this? So what they learned is that leptin levels regulate how much fuel fat is providing for your body. And of course, you need to know there's a bunch of mediary, um, like cellular biological things that go between leptin and the actual fat. The beta oxidation is what it's called, where it produces the fuel you need. But leptin is the gatekeeper. So think of leptin as the gatekeeper. So leptin levels, this is what they, this is what they learned. As leptin levels in your body, you remember leptin is coming from primarily your fat. Leptin comes from other organs too. But it is when you do blood leptin tests, like they do blood insulin, all the things, it's what you're seeing is an indication of how much your fat is producing. Okay. And each cell of fat produces leptin. So when you look at your fat as an organ, you need to see each cell individually is an organ. Okay. Producing fat. The larger the cells, the more leptin it produces. Okay. So as leptin levels rise, what they found is that fuel was released from fat cells. Beta oxidation occurred. So basically you have a fat cell right here. Here's your mitochondria. So think of the mitochondria as the engine. It can take the fuel, combust it and spit it out, right? As, as usable, as usable for the, the muscles. So that's ATP. Don't worry about this. This is not a physiology class. I'm not going to test you on this part, but I want you to know the mechanisms involved. So here is a fatty acid strain. As there are like doors or gates on this membrane, this double walled membrane. CPT1, CPT2, you don't need to know that, but there's like doors all along that mitochondria. There is an asshole here. So you have to get this to the door and then the door has to open. Leptin essentially opens the door for your fatty acid strand to get into that mitochondria where it can go through beta oxidation, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, ATP, okay? So as leptin levels rise, what do you think happens? So leptin allows this to happen. It actually promotes fat, fatty acid oxidation through beta oxidation, right? So leptin increases and they found that there's more fuel available. So the more leptin you have, the more fuel fat provides. So if your leptin levels increase, le your fat metabolism provides more fuel. So that's how this is the number one. And then they thought, okay, let's look at it the other way. So what happens is leptin levels go down. So because, and obviously they, 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 saw, they saw this outcome and didn't know the process, right? They didn't know this process. They learned that through experimentation, this process. So now they know that's happened. That's why fuel is released. So as leptin levels go down, you have less fat metabolism, less fuel is available. It doesn't mean it's not available. It just means there's less fuel produced by fat. Prior to this, and this is what I was taught. And again, these are all theories. Calories in, calories out. You're getting fueled by your food. How many of you have heard you're fueled by your food? Well, how is that? How is the food in this form today to fuel what I'm doing right now. So is today's food, food fueling me right now? Did I get fueled by today's food? It's got to go through a process. It's got to digest. 
get it's got to get all the things and then do we know where it gets stored is it where is it stored where is my food stored today so for it to be today's fuel it would have to probably be stored as fat right so there is a lot wrong with calories in calories out but it's a theory and science this is how the scientific process works we try something out with what we know as we know more we can change it we can evolve we can adapt so calories in calories out may not be best described from how much food you eat because we don't know ex exactly how much fuel you're going to get but what we do know is when leptin levels are elevated you get a lot more fuel so how it might actually be they thought it might actually not be from the food so much as how much fat you have is deciding how much fuel you're getting any questions with that right now and then again i'm going to try to have time at the end if you have any questions so let me just rephrase that again <clears throat> how much fuel you get from your stores is really dependent on how much leptin you have and then your fat pro provides that immediate immediate sensation of fuel right the, so this actually they found later. The first thing they discovered about leptin is that it regulates your hunger. So when leptin levels are elevated in the brain, right? Because it's in the brain too. When leptin levels are it, higher in the brain, it shuts off agouti and neuropeptide Y. Those are the main peptides, the chemicals in the brain that stimulate hunger. So leptin says, we're turning it off. You're not hungry, we got fuel. It's a, again, it tells the body, the brain, we're good. We're good, rest, relax, chill, we're good. So leptin in the brain says, hey, you're good, you're not hungry. As leptin levels in the brain go down, agouti, neuropeptide Y, or the hunger hormones are active. And the way it shows up is agitation, irritability. There's a sense of time, it affects cognition a little bit in the brain so it's so think of it this way when you're hungry there is a there is a natural assessment we all make around hunger i'm getting hungry how long till i need to eat you're doing it how long so it affects the sense of time and you're aware of it the other same thing is like urinating when you go to the bathroom you're thinking can i hold it there's a sense of time involved in the feeling so when you're hungry it isn't coming from here. It's coming from your brain. There's physical sensations that we associate to hunger, like drowling, stomach kind of maybe empty, but true hunger actually is stimulated from the brain. So as leptin levels rise, the message in the brain is we're good, we're fueled, there's no point. As leptin levels go down, there's not adequate fuel and hunger goes up. So leptin levels rise, metabolism improves for fat. Hunger goes away. Leptin levels go down, fat metabolism is less, hunger rises. So you need to know that. How that works, and this is really interesting. So blood, so let's go back to the body versus the brain. So as your body, as, as leptin levels are at an appropriate amount, which is different for everybody, however much your body needs, right? Um, as your body doesn't, isn't adequately supplying fuel to whatever demand is happening, it will take from blood sugar, right? That's the second one. It will take it from blood sugar, right? And if that zone, that range your brain needs starts to go down, that's what triggers leptin levels to go down in the brain. So as blood sugar goes down, brain leptin levels or hypothalamic leptin levels go down in response to, to blood sugar. Again, so as fat is no longer supplying adequate fuel, the body will make up the difference by tapping into blood sugar. And the brain says, whoa, hold on, that's mine. That's mine and it will only allow so much. And that's when your hunger starts to arise. It makes you consciously seek out food. 
If you do not listen to that hunger, for whatever reason, you're on intermittent fasting, you're not paying, you're trying to not eat, you're in actual famine versus an artificial famine, um, you're dieting, you don't have time, you don't have money, you don't have the resources. Your brain, your body will then go into glucose and protein because it will not let you take more blood sugar. It won't. It is preserving it for the brain. It has to maintain the brain's ability to function at all times. So your body can take only so much of that blood sugar before your brain tells it to screw off. And the body then has to create its own resources. So it will then tap into blood glucose. And this is starvation science. This isn't exercise science. It's starvation science. Okay. So as leptin levels are no longer adequate, fat is no longer adequate to fuel the body. The body starts to tap into blood sugar. The brain says, oh, hell no, that's mine. Hunger goes up. You ignore it because you're intermittent fasting or whatever the fuck you're doing, right? Your body then has to make up the difference. It will start using glycogen and protein. Ketone bodies. Right? So ketosis is right down here. You with me? As that, so the, um, let me make sure I'm on the right track here in my organization. So hunger is a very big deal because it is an indication of where your leptin levels are. If you're not hungry, where are your leptin levels? We know at minimum they're adequate. They're adequate. Are they too high? We don't know, right? So they do know this, that with leptin, it is not this highly beneficial thing that keeps on going, right? They originally thought, well, people who are obese must not have enough leptin. That was their initial research question when they found out more leptin improves fat metabolism. They assume, People who have more and more body fat don't burn fat and they're hungry all the time. That was an assumption, right? What they found is actually the more fat someone has, it's not a linear curve. It's actually accelerates. Like, I mean, I know this is kind of going back on itself, but you know, you get the point that with each fat cell. So first of all, they learned that smaller cells produce less. The bigger the fat cell, the more lipids are in it, the more white fat cells, fat cells produce like significantly higher amounts of leptin than these small cells don't produce very much, right? Brown versus white fat. And they found that the more body fat a person has, specifically white fat, the, their amount of fuel is exponentially higher exponential that means that it is like wham it accelerates in how much they're producing so it really confused the scientists how is it that this is happening well the bigger fat cells produce more leptin and then they started looking at the genetics and dna of this so what they found is that fat cells when you have tons of fuel released and combined with tons of leptin so large amounts of leptin with large amounts of fuel, that this stimulates the DNA of your fat cells to replicate. So you create more fat cells and the body is amazing. It is meant to adapt, right? It's meant to adapt. I gotta produce, I gotta create more storage because there's a lot of leptin here. We have a lot of fuel. We need more, we need more because there's more demand, right? There's so much demand in relation to the expenditure. So this is where calories out does come in. If there's more leptin and more fuel than your demand requires. So now you're having, there's, it's excessive, right? You're going to actually stimulate your fat cells to multiply and create larger and fatter. And what do you think these fat cells do? They produce even more more leptin, more fuel. So as you get more body fat, you're more fueled. What do you think happens? Well, I'm going to say that we have one more thing to talk about. Any questions about this? So let's bring this back to hunger. 
the assumption was they must be hungry all the time. People must be hungry all the time. So it might be um, resistant, leptin resistance. It's still a theory, okay? So if you're, let's just say, not hungry, again, so with hunger, if you're not hungry, your leptin levels are adequate. Let's just say you wanna eat because it's time because it's the kind thing to do, it's courteous. Let's just say um, you're eating out of boredom or you're eating because you're angry and you might not be eating, what if you're drinking, you know, and you're not hungry. So you're essentially overriding that message that says you're good, we're cool, we're good, relax and rest. And you're overstimulating your leptin. And so, but this doesn't require you eat, just so you know. So back to eating. So now we know eating stimulates leptin. There's a lot of things. So that was the next question. What is stimulating your fat to release its leptin? Stress is the number one. Perceived threat, fight, flight, stimulates blood sugar. Blood sugar stimulates leptin, right, on the high end. Perceived threat, perceived um, fear, fear, anger, the most sensitive, anxiety. You're stimulating it already. You have already stimulated. And this is really actually kind of amazing because if you're stimulating leptin without having to eat, your need for food is significantly less. When you think about fight or flight, survival mode. It's amazing because if you were in fight or flight, you're not looking to forage. You're not going to go, Hey, let's stop here and go pick some berries. No, you're trying to survive. You're trying to hide. Right? So the body positions you to not need food. So under those circumstances, you're a little more bionic. If you're in fight or flight, your body's need for food is significantly less because of the central nervous systems, your perceived sense of threat actually stimulates your fat to release fuel because of fight or flight. Your gut in fight or flight stops working. It's not meant to be eating food. Digestion stops, paracelsis stops, salivation stops because your need for food is less. Foraging is meant for this. Breaking bread, sharing meal, having wine is meant for this, right? So in fight or flight, you've already stimulated your left and you don't need to eat. So the reality is you don't need to eat for this to happen, period. You don't. They've, they've tested this with different hormones that stimulate it. Food does stimulate it. And there's different, if you think of... Um, food, think of it from a position that not all food is equal. Some produce, some stimulates more, some stimulates less, right? However, you don't need to eat to get your fat to release its, its leptin than to release its fuel. So the whole concept of food, calories in, calories out is super not applicable actually, because it's only in relation to where your leptin levels are at which is actually more in relation to where your brain and your perceptions are at around reality. Any questions? We're gonna keep on going. So increased leptin, increased fuel availability. Ideally, you have adequate fuel needs and you're staying in what I call the Goldilocks zone. Um, there's lots of things that use the term Goldilocks zone because it is kind of a special term around this type of graph. So when you look at leptin, we all have an upside down U curve. Every single one of us. Can you guys see that? Let me, let me put this in black. I don't know why it's changed. There's an upside down U curve. So more, so as your leptin levels rise, we'll use leptin level. And then we can say, uh, we'll say fuel needs on this side, fuel metabolism or fuel needs, fuel demands on the x-axis. 
So as your fuel demands increase, you know, from zero up, there's an ideal amount of leptin to meet those needs. So if I'm here, you probably only need like that, right? And this, this can change, it's dynamic, it's not static, right? But typically you wanna find this, this is called the Goldilocks zone. Your fuel demands and your leptin levels are around the same spot. Did I do that wrong? Maybe I switched these around, I can't remember. So that's the Goldilocks zone, meaning you're getting enough fuel relative to your body's demand coming from the resources you have, right? Without needing to tap into this. Again, this is happening kind of inexchangeably all day long, but ideally you get 90% of your fuel source from that. That's usually the case for everybody without effort, right? So you want to find, and you don't need to know that. So the question is this, what do we really need to track? If you're not hungry, what's that a sign of? If you're not hungry, you're here or here, right? You're here or here. This is, so another word they use for kind of this whole system is inflammation. Oh my God, I'm inflamed. Well, yeah, everybody is. Everybody in this room is inflamed because you need to be to survive. That's what gets you to this Goldilocks zone. The question is then when you have too much, right? <laughs> when you have too much and chronically, because your body's meant to overstimulate, right? But is, is it chronic? So if you overstimulate your leptin and you have too much fuel for your resources, you're going to multiply your fat cells, okay? So oftentimes, if you're under stress, you're probably, if you actually listened and monitored your hunger rhythms, you're not hungry. That doesn't mean you don't want to cope, escape, distract yourself, right? You're probably, maybe if you're a stress eater, you're not hungry. There's a difference between hunger and desire, right? Hunger and fight or flight coping mechanisms to distract. So um, let's go into the hunger scale. Any questions here? Do we understand it? It's pretty cool. So again, your need for food is not regulated necessarily so strictly with your caloric expenditure. It has more to do with how much fat you have and how stressed you are. Um, also, if you're traveling, changing uh, how much sun exposure you get, did you not get enough sleep? Are you on your menstrual cycle? Because your menstrual cycle directly affects this, women. This directly affects your hunger rhythms. Pregnancy hugely stimulates leptin because the need for the, the child, you're more likely to gain fat eating 2,000. So let's say pre pregnancy, you ate 2,000 calories a day. Let's just use that as an estimate. You can eat the same amount when you're pregnant, expending twice as much uh, uh, energy because you're pregnant and gain twice as much fat because how HCG, which is a hormone from your uterus stimulates leptin. So you're stimulating leptin when you're pregnant. So you're more sensitive to gain weight, which means you're less need, your, your need for food is less, which means in famine, you're more likely to survive if you're pregnant because you don't need as much food to maintain this zone right here. So this zone is not regulated the way they taught. It's regulated by hormones and it's highly impacted by our evolutionary wiring and endocrine system. So how much energy that we can compute from a food does not equate to how much our body gets from eating it. Okay. So how we can use hunger rhythms to find that Goldilocks zone. And the Goldilocks zone really helps with sleep. Um, if you're under stress, if you've traveled, if you didn't sleep enough, if um, you're ill, I mean, think about times where you've been sick, had a temperature and you haven't needed to eat for a long time, no hunger your leptin levels are higher during that time. You're actually burning a lot of fat <laughs> at that time. Your body's trying to uh, distribute where its energy needs to be, be, where it needs to be resourced and allocated to. And usually if you're fighting off like the flu or something, 
it doesn't want to hang out in your gut. It wants to focus on your immune system, right? So to re remove food consumption from your day actually is beneficial in terms of it being able to allocate where it resource, where the energy resources go, right? So our need for food is not based on our expenditure. It's actually based on our hormones. And expenditure can affect that. So with hunger, um, how many of you have heard of, have you, have any of you ever eaten based on this hunger rhythm intentionally? Intuitive eating, that's one way people, I don't like to call it that because it's not intuitive at all, but how many of you have heard of intuitive eating? Right, and that, this is the premise of intuitive eating, but I, I'm going to refrain from using that language because this is a sense. Okay, so just like I used in my example earlier in this little bit of lecture is that urinating. Do we call it when I go to the bathroom, am I intuitively urinating? It's a sense, right? So it's not intuitive at all, actually. It's an actual sense, like temperature, urination, right? Like when you're hot, you know you need to uh, take layers off. If you're cold, you have a sense to put layers back on. You have that sense to so urinate, and it's not all or nothing. You have time, right? So eating to hunger is like peeing based on urinating regulation, right? So I need you to see it similarly. So again, we're going to use the way that I like to teach it is with this upside down U curve. Can you guys see? Can you see this? Can you see that? Okay. So an upside down U curve again. So you need to pay attention because our we're going to have a big homework assignment. Um, not, I'll probably give it to you on Wednesday for you to work on. You need to pay attention to this because you know how in some classes they require you to monitor all your food. You have to measure all your food. You have to measure how many calories you've been eating. We're not going to do that because that's old. It's good to do that, but we're going to focus on your hunger rhythms. And with the idea of how leptin works in mind, okay? So on a scale of one to 10, we have five and six in the middle. So I like to call this, this side, the hunger scale side of this. And this is the fullness scale. And at the top of this rainbow is basically neutrality, right? You're here nor there. One way to think of that five to six, let's just start at the top there. You feel nothing. Do you guys remember as a kid outside playing, 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 playing? You're busy. And your mom's like, come in for dinner or I'm so, I'm so X generation. <laughs> that was so, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how you guys did it, but your mom would be like, come eat your food. It's time to eat. And you're like, no, I'm busy. I'm having fun. I'm playing. Do you guys have a memory like that at all? It's lunchtime. And you're like, screw lunch. We're playing out on the, you know, on the playground. You weren't hungry yet. But the moment you're freaking hungry, you run into the kitchen and you're like, where is my Right? So when you're busy and you're enjoying your life, you're probably somewhere in here. It's not calling to you, you're not agitated. It's like going pee. Remember, like how long did it take for you to come in and actually go pee? Probably a while. So that's the goal, in, at least here in the hunger scale. If you're in this zone, your body is fueled. You're doing great. You're feeling energized. Oh, that's what I forgot. I forgot the thyroid. We'll get into the thyroid in a second. So... On this end of it, you usually, once you're here, you might wake up in this zone. Typically, a lot of people wake up feeling not really anything, and then hunger arises as the day goes on, and your natural inflammatory markers go up, which is a good thing to a certain extent. So a four on this hunger scale, so you get hungrier as we go down, and this becomes physically more uh, discomfort. So there's physical discomfort here in the stomach, like mechanical, like a mechanical discomfort, um, gut pain, think of this as mechanical discomfort. On this end, you have brain 
brain agitation. You're agitated. Um, irritability. And it, and it can be painful in the gut. Trust me, when I was on the anorexic side of my eating disorder, that feeling of pain, I thought was being a hero, like I had done something great, but it's it's really bad. So you're, there's physical pain down here, but in general, this is more brain agitation. A sense of urgency is how this arises. I need to eat, but I can wait. That's a four. I'm hungry, but I could wait. At a three, so this is I'm going. I'm I patient. Let's go to a restaurant. Let's order out. Let's let's make some dinner. I have patience to actually do a recipe to fix my food. You're patient. At a three, that's good. I need it, and there's a, a sense of urgent. I need it now, right? This is when you're going to Sonic, you're getting yourself some chili cheese Frito tots. <laughs> Because you don't have the, you're, you're, you're like, this is like, I got to go here and I'll wet myself. Okay. Again, I like to parallel, parallel those two because they're very similar in the same area of the brain. Agitation, irritability, sense of time constraint. At a two, you're hanger, you're a mean asshole, rude, no tolerance. And you, the, your lights are starting to turn dimmer. It feels a little dimmer in your brain. You might be shaky. So three is I need to eat now. Patience is run its course. Two is you have no patience and you're angry at the world. Hanger, uh, shaky, um, your body, your posture might start to round a little bit. And uh, one, you stop being hungry and you are now using this source right here to make up the difference because your brain will only fight for so long before it says, screw you, you're going to have to use your own resources, right? The blood sugar is starting to get used right here. Your brain fuel is starting to get used right here. So where is the best time to consume? Assuming we have the luxury of having food available. Where in here is the best time? Anybody have a guess? You watched about that lecture. I think I detailed it. What do you guys think? Should you get to a two where you're pissed and angry? Should you even go at a three when you're like, I have no patience? Well, what about a four where you could wait? Because your leptin levels aren't really that low yet. Your blood sugar is starting to get used and your brain is saying, yeah, go fuck yourself, right? That's, it's beginning to happen. I like to suggest, because it's not black and white for everybody, but ideally, if you have the ability to do it, you eat at a 3.5-ish, plus or minus, right? There's a zone around when, when it's a great time to do it. Because at this point, there is a need. Your whatever stress you're in isn't stressed enough, right? Um, the fuel, your fat is no longer supplying. Your leptin levels are low. And... And it could be because you did some kick-ass workout. We don't freaking know it, nor does it matter. If you're hungry, I care what the source is. Your leptin levels are low. You might not have slept well. And the more less sleep you get, the more your body needs to stimulate other things to try to get you to fall asleep, right? So who cares why? When you're hitting around a three and a half, that's ideal, right? And again, this isn't an exact science. There's a lot of strategy. What if you're out with friends? What if they're having a cocktail? What if I want coffee? We're having a meeting. Yeah, there's gray in here. There's tons of gray. This is the beautiful thing about eating to physical hunger is it's not a messed up diet that's going to trigger a lot of emotional problems, which we'll go into next lecture. How diets mess with this. So when should you stop? So let's go into the fullness side. So a seven, so a five is the beginning of nothing. Like, um, go back to your childhood and you're doing something really, really fun and your friends are all out there doing it. And you're like, oh, FOMO, I'm missing out. They're, you know, making a snow fort. Ah, I got to get out there. You will stop here because your pain is gone. That agitation and irritability is gone. It's like you urinated enough. You could sit there and wait, but you're done. Go. This is where you're at. So typically between this zone, pain is gone. This does not mean that the food doesn't taste good. 
It just means your hunger pain is gone. Food is still going to taste real good right here, right? It tastes delicious. That extra glass of wine with body, that blue cheese and the steak, mm, right? But this zone is kind of hard when you're eating to feel because of that pleasure that the brain is getting, right? The connection you have with friends, the you know, again, all of those important psychological aspects about food that we'll talk about next lecture is happening in here. So six, so six, five is, um, I would say, neutral. This is driving me bonkers, sorry. This is um, satisfied. Seven is satiated. Okay, so satiated and satisfied. Satiated, satisfied. So you could totally eat more. So typically at a six, this is when you're like, I gotta go, I wanna go play. I got shit to do. If your friends called you and said, hey, will you please come help me? I just broke up with my girl or boyfriend, I found out they were cheating. I'm packing up my shit. I'm getting out now. And you're like, okay, you need to eat. How much would you eat if you knew you were about to go move furniture for two to three hours? You wouldn't stop here, right? You wouldn't stop here because you're going to be, you're not going to feel good. You might say, okay, give me five minutes. Are you going to get to... Well, let me let me get to, let me do eight here. So eight is full. When someone says they are full, they are now describing physical mechanical pain. Leptin does not do this. Leptin does nothing over here. It only gets rid of that pain. Just so you know, leptin gets rid of hunger pain. It does not make you full. That's that's your body, right? That's the mechanical. So eight is full. You're feeling some physical pain and and you're now getting affected. Nine is I have to unbutton my pants. I need to lay down. I feel a little nauseous. 10 is you're in pain. You may have to go to the hospital. If you're making yourself cute, you can actually hurt yourself. Okay. So if you're going to move furniture, a friend, for a friend, where would you stop? Where would you stop? Anybody? Well, you're burping. You can feel it. I would, I would personally, typically, most people naturally don't want to be here when they're doing physical activity. When would you want to play volleyball? You want to be like, oh shit, <laughs> burping it up a little bit. That's an eight. Okay. No. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, just think about it. Like, apply it to like, um, because as kids. You're doing all that activity in just your natural creative space, right? So we, that's why I like to say, remember when you're a kid and you're super busy and your mom's bugging you to come eat and you're like, no, and then you're really hungry. You go eat. Are you going to wait to get here to go back out? No, you're probably going to eat just enough to get rid of that feeling and get back out there and have fun, right? Same with like physical activity. Chances are, if you're going to go exercise or you know, you're going to do something laborious, you're not going to get to an eight. It sucks. Tired bloated, digestive enzyme or digestive like acid sitting at your throat, burping, that's an eight. So you're probably gonna stop somewhere in here-ish. Remember, it's always an ish because it's not an exact, there's a lot of gray in the zone so that you don't have those physical symptoms, but you know you've eaten enough that you might not be hungry for a while. So you can tend to what you're doing in the moment. So the Goldilocks zone, what I like to recommend is actually here, somewhere there. What I found teaching this for decades, thousands, I've, I've literally worked with well over a thousand patients. If you stop here, you're gonna be hungry real quick. People who practice this, they're like, I stopped at a five. They're like, but I'm always that hungry. It's like, oh, I always have the, feeling like I need to go back and eat. It doesn't really last very long. That makes sense. So if when I found that people hit a, a solid six plus or minus five, you know, they felt better. This zone, if you think of it this way, actually can look like this. <laughs> like in terms of 
how it sustains over time if you hit the right zone. Now, if you end up going over here, it could sit like this for like days, depending on how much fat you have. You're not hungry. You're just not, very low hunger, um, depending on how much fat you have. So when I work with patients, we would do this observation for at least a month. The more fat a patient had, the less hunger they had for a long period of time. I had um, the clients would be like, Robin, I haven't been hungry for a couple of days. I feel amazing. It's like, I'm not going to argue with how evolution worked with body fat here. You need water, maybe drink some salt, you know, but however those mechanisms are for you, this is not an exact science. Right. So and the other thing I found with clients who had more body fat is that their hunger, when it did come on, so they had very long periods of time with no hunger. We're talking six to eight hours. And when hunger did arise, it was rapid. It was like, bam, blood sugar dropped super fast. Part of that, I believe, is because when you have more body fat, let's just say you're 300 pounds at 50 percent body fat. Even then, you're burning 3,000 to 4,000 calories just at rest. And so their fuel demand was like mine running for an hour straight, right? So there, how this works, it, it might be a sharp, this might be a sharp graph for you. It might be a slower graph for you. No one knows this. Because no one knows when you're stressed, your sleep cycles, what's going on with the full freaking moon, how your menstrual cycle works with this. If you're taking a form of medication, that's affecting this. So when someone wants to tell you, here's when you should eat and how much time between, I would, I would just go, oh, that was so nice. See you later. Because <laughs> no one knows. The diet industry is constantly trying to get your attention and money. So they're going to pretend like they know exactly how much you should eat, when and how. When, if you don't know this science, you're hurting someone. You're actually not, what you're recommending is harming them. You're putting them into a position um, to really not do well. Now, when someone is psychologically, um, let's just say in distress, their need for food is significantly less, period, because they're inflamed, because they're triggering this to be released at all times. Um, have I told you guys my bout with type two diabetes? All right. Oh my gosh. So I am prone to type two diabetes. I do not match in any way, anything else. I don't, I am prone to type two diabetes under chronic stress. I moved five times in, in five years across the country and moving alone, even if I'm not perceiving it as stress, just the way our biological, psychological evolutionary process works with moving is I have three kids that I'm moving. Where are we going to live? What is the school system like? What's our, how are we going to make any money? Blah, blah, blah. I was stressed. And over a five-year period of time, when we finally settled down and finally had insurance and finally could, um, I got, could go to the doctor, hadn't been in five years, I was like, I should probably just get a get the work done. I'm going to get blood work. I just, I need to know I haven't, I haven't gotten any health care. I get a call a week later. Uh, you need to come in. Your blood work came back abnormal. And I kind of knew, because I know this science, I probably have diabetes, probably have type two diabetes. And it's not because my pancreas sucks. It's because I have been in chronic. My mom was diagnosed with brain cancer during that time. I had filed bankruptcy on a business during that time, moved my family across the country, wrote a book, published a book, became partnership in a medical clinic, moved again while maintaining my partnership uh, across the country while having three kids who I'm having to move. And I didn't react. I actually didn't respond to the call because I, I knew. And a year later, I was like, I'm going back in. It's been a year. We haven't moved. I'm working on my next book project. I feel good. And uh, my numbers came back normal. But when I went in, I said, hey, what was the issue? And they go, oh, yeah, you were diabetic. Your A1Cs were off the roof. And I was like, yeah. 
Yeah, that makes sense. So they call it emotional diabetes. A hundred years ago when they studied fight or flight and blood sugar and insulin and what they knew at the time, they called it emotional diabetes. Now it is not diabetes. It just means your body's producing a lot of glucose without you needing to eat because of gluconeogenesis in this process that they've known for a long time, right? I also ate to hunger. I never had issues. I never overate, right? I always, I've been eating in this zone since I recovered from an eating disorder 20 years ago, right? And I still was diabetic. So it had everything to do with not my food consumption, but just how my body was responding to that chronic stress. So the Goldilocks zone is here. So I do want to add this. I forgot that this is such a big part of this. So how leptin affects your thyroid? Does anybody in here know what the, the primary role of your thyroid is? System. Well, all immune system is a lot of things. You're right. But the what does your thyroid do? Release your hormones and stuff. It does have hormones. It's part of your endocrine system. What were you? Everything is yes and yes. Anybody else? Did you say something? Yes. Think of your thyroid. The way I like to teach it is it's the light bulb of your energy. So I use the word very specifically for, for fat metabolism is fuel, not energy, right? There's a difference. So your thyroid is a primary regulator of your body's energy needs. Right. Think of it as a light bulb that has a dimmer, a dimmer on it. Like it's not an off and on switch for a light. It's got a dimmer on it. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? So the light bulb can dim down or it can turn really bright. Right. And the brain does this, the thyroid and the anterior pituitary and the thyroid, they work together to either turn the light bulb up or turn it down. And it happens during and throughout the day, it occurs with diurnal rhythm, sleep cycle that turns down, it turns up, stress turns it up, which can create a, a compensating turn down. So your energy, like how much energy you feel typically is coming from your thyroid, which is in the neck. So it's a gland in the neck. Leptin turns the, the dial up on that. So we know that the more leptin you have, the more your thyroid stimulates. And it is an upside down new curve. It is not a, you know, a linear curve. As leptin levels go down, the thyroid suppresses, the, it dims down. That's why when you're on this end, around a two, you can feel this. Energy plummets. You feel it. You feel low energy. That is your thyroid. So there is this incredible link, you know, again, in starvation, if you're, if you start to feel hungry, right? You start to hear it hit the zone. You're feeling a little of that pain. You ignore it because of whatever reason, um, your thyroid starts to dim down your energy costs. So that's a way to find that equilibrium again. So your body will find an equilibrium just smaller down here now. So your metabolism is lower. So your fuel demands are less. So that also accommodates to preserving blood glucose because your needs are less. If the thyroid suppresses, your metabolism reduces. Your need for energy, your energy needs drop, which means your fuel needs drop, which means it's going to try to find that Goldilocks zone without you eating. And it'll do it by reducing your energy needs, increasing your use of glycogen and protein storage, and you'll find that equilibrium. So this is where metabolism over time, it's not just with people who chronically diet or starve or whatever you wanna call it. Over time, it isn't just muscle loss that decreases your metabolism. You're actually training your thyroid to function at a lower, dimmer setting, right? So leptin levels can really, what I found working with patients in a clinical setting for 15 years, working with well over a thousand people is when no matter what amount of body fat they had, when they ate in this Goldilocks zone, they felt significantly better. I had patients who had type two diabetes 
who, when they actually did this, stopped needing to take insulin. It's pretty cool, but it really requires that you listen to it, that you understand it, that you really can just differentiate physical need, right, from emotional or boredom or a psychological impulse that's not necessarily coming from hunger. Are there any questions? Anybody have any insight or questions about this? So um, I wanna talk quickly about the difference of different sizes then. So the picture, so I'm just gonna use this example. Here is an individual, your typical normal, Hey, how you doing? Human being. Okay. And here's someone, and this is how much fat they have. So we're just going to give a visible, they got, you know, 15 to 20% body fat. We're going to allocate it into this kind of pie chart amount right there. 15 to 20%. And then we have this individual who is equally as happy. Hi there. And let's just say they have 40% body fat. Now remember the more, what happens over time for whatever reason, and this person might not have big white fat cells. This could be genetically, 40% is pretty high, but you can assume the more visceral fat, if we know this, the more abdominal visceral fat, the more association to those larger white fat cells, which means they're probably producing more and more leptin, which means their need for food is less, which means they're more bionic, to be honest with you. In a, in, in a um, famine situation, who's gonna survive? Who's gonna survive? This person is. That person's not, just you know. Um, okay, so. These two, same person, let's just so that we can equalize the metabolism here. Same exact person, right? This person's 40% body fat. This person's, let's say, 18% body fat or 20%. And they're both hungry. What does that tell you about their leptin levels? Are their leptin levels high or low if they're hungry? Anybody else? Anybody think differently? Right, so if they're hungry, their leptin levels are low and they're using what resource? What food resource? Blood sugar. Remember, if your blood sugar is going down, hunger is going up and your brain's like, no. So hunger is a sign of low blood sugar. Okay, so um, <laughs> they're both getting hungry. Right, so let's get our hunger scale here. And they both eat. Let's just say they this person eats an apple and this person eats an apple. Remember, that same exact apple is stimulating their fat cells. Well, this person has a lot more fat cells. And don't forget, each fat cell is getting stimulated equally. It's the same stimulus for this person but this one has got more fat cells to stimulate. So who's getting more energy from this apple? This is an 80 calorie apple. How many calories in fuel did that person get eating the same thing? Is this confusing any of you? Because your fat is what's releasing the fuel. So they ate the same thing. This person got an astronomically higher amount of leptin and fuel. So they might have eaten 80 calories, but they might have gotten 500 calories from the output of the fuel that says, here you go. And this person doesn't have as much fat. So it might've gotten, they might've gotten 50 calories from fat. I'm just throwing arbitrary numbers out there. Right? So in terms of this Goldilocks zone, and again, relative to expenditure, this person's burning around 3,000 calories a day. This person's probably burning around 2,200 2, on average. Just throwing numbers out there. Chances are 
this and, and let's just say they had a sandwich and let's just say um a carrot okay and this person also had a sandwich and a carrot and this person from this same lunch meal probably got around 15 to 2000 calories of fuel release from their fat and this person got maybe 300 so in terms of fuel equilibrium this person's probably still really hungry they're hungry still. So on this upside down new curve hunger scale, this person's still at a four. And on this scale, this person might be at a seven or eight eating the same thing. Is that helping you see this? Why calories in, calories out relative to food is inappropriate. It's more appropriate based on, had these two listened to hunger, this person might've had half of the sandwich, half of that, and maybe have waited for the carrot. This person's probably eating two sandwiches, another apple and a bag of chips, plus some chocolate <laughs> because they're freaking hungry. Just so you know. Now, if this person has negative body image issues, they're gonna feel so bad about themselves, which puts pressure on them to diet or restrict which then actually has a whole different consequence of emotional eating problems because they're constantly believing food is going to be in famine. So we're gonna talk about that next week, or um, two things, on Wednesday, is how the brain uh, consciously interprets resources, especially those primary resources like food, water, and shelter, how psychologically dependent we are on needing to know that our food specifically is secure. So if your food is going away, isn't enough, is unhealthy, let's say, or in other words, dangerous, you're going to be impulse to eat, even if you're not hungry. The brain is saying you need to get food, you need to feel safe and secure with food, even when you're not hungry. So that's where this becomes different, where this person probably has body image shame and has tried to diet, felt disconnected, wasn't listening to their hunger. They might've been force feeding when they weren't supposed to. And this person over here is eating all sorts of food and not really feeling satiated or satisfied, assuming that they're both happy and not under stress, right? So if you're under stress, if this person, let's just say, is under stress, ah, this is happening without needing to eat, and the probability that they're going to be adding more fat is a much higher probability for survival reasons. Okay, any questions? There is, um, I will post homework, it's reading, so make sure you check the homework and read what I'm assigning before the next before Wednesday, that's it. And that reading you